Hello, LinkedIn. It's me, Dennis, and I am here with a reasonably spontaneous conversation with Matthew Brackett. Hello, Matthew. Hello, Dennis. Thank you for letting me be on these wonderful spontaneous conversations. And thank well, you for your one minute posts on LinkedIn. I enjoy well, them. it is my pleasure. LinkedIn, I'm just learning so much about LinkedIn and, and really getting an opportunity to be able to value it. And I want to know from you, how have you been using LinkedIn? What is the uh, what is the path and how are you using it in order to build your coaching practice? Because I know that you've been doing so many podcasts lately and being able to do what have you been? Let's start there first. What have you been learning about yourself during this during this time of uh, expanding and, and taking your message out to the world? Oh, boy, I've been learning about myself I've been learning a lot it's very hard <laughs> that's what I've been learning and um I am my greatest enemy I am my biggest obstacle it's so funny because you know some people that know me very well but well, you you know they would say that I have a lot of skills and qualities and talents and and that I make it all look so easy but <laughs> it is very I think just creating my brand if I come from a very different background of Mm -hmm. where I I never had to market myself you know I I I was in ministry and so it was just always there and so I did. but now it's totally different approach so yes I've while I was I flourished in other roles this one is is challenging and I say that in in with with a sort of gusto because I like challenges yeah. but it's so fascinating to see how I how I get my own way and, and limit myself it's natural for the human experience but it's so that's challenging and now that's then so that's what I'm learning I'm learning a lot about how how I can be my obstacle and get in the way and um, and that's that's the answer to your question yeah All right and so how do we get out of our own way? I mean, I wonder about that from a psychological perspective on how it is that I am so critical. I have such a hard time taking positive encouragement, but I very much get the negative encouragement, my own negative. So it's almost like I think of it like going to the gym. Like I have spent all this time working on this negative energy, all, all of this, what am I not comparing myself to others that, and which is to me, the biggest danger that there is, is living in the comparative space. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will actually just bringing that up when I, when I talk about comparison, I think I talk comparing ourselves to others, in my view, leads to two basic things. It can lead to other things, but leads to one is stepping on ourselves. In other words, downgrading ourselves and comparing ourselves, or stepping on others, downgrading others. Right? Those would be the sort of the two extremes. But also, but I do say we can learn so much from others. So, I, and I wouldn't call it comparison, but rather I would say when we look at someone what information and, and data and, and qualities and skills, what can I learn from this person? And is it something that I can bring into my own life? It isn't always something that we can. So that's that's sort of that game where I want to be like that, but then you're setting yourself up for frustration because you're not playing to your strengths, right? And so maybe that's, maybe you can't be like that, but you can, what is it that you like and how can you develop that in your own life in a way that aligns with your strengths and abilities? Because it is my own strengths and abilities, because I cannot compare myself to you. The minute I do, I begin, I lose. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, and so I think about it when I'm in my meditations, when I want, I say, I want to be right sized. I want to bring whatever are my, my qualities, my gifts to the table and leverage them, which is completely separate from having to say it. If there was only one Dennis Tardon who has ever been, whoever will be then i by default cannot compare i default the minute i get into comparison i'm going to be losing i will never be right sized mm -hmm. yes but we there is a natural tendency in us as human beings to compare right and i think <sighs> with the, with the birth of social media and everything it it brings it to a whole nother level because we're constantly looking at other people people are constantly putting themselves out there so that that's in, I think mental health is 
challenge nowadays and to a much higher degree, partly I mean, for many reasons, but this is one of them, especially the younger generations, because we all look for identity, right? And so, and then when we see other people, we're like, then, then it creates, it can create a lot of negative cycles. Yep. And that's what it does for me. And so, th so staying in our positive cycle. So what do you use to stay into that positive place or when you when you do when you experience that or you get into the comparison you get into the mode of saying oh well, wait a minute this is outside my comfort zone what are the ways that you that you're using uh, some of the tools so that i can i can use them myself matthew thank you dennis thank you i would say two things I, it's as we grow through leaning into discomfort um, but as our brain also wants safety and security, so we we step away from discomfort. So I, we have to being very intentional about leaning into it and patiently leaning into it, right? giving ourselves a little bit of grace, but not too much grace where we we don't allow ourselves to grow. Right. So to lean, and then another thing is, I think bringing other people into the picture, whether it be a networking group, or an accountability group, a coach, or someone that will walk with me, so that I don't do this on my own. Because when we do it on our own, we begin to rationalize, we make it easier for ourselves, or we give ourselves excuses, and so we keep putting things off, and then that creates sort of a negative cycle. Well, we put things off, then we feel bad because I just want to be doing this, and I'm not, and all this. Negative. So we, what we want to create is a virtuous, a virtuous cycle that yes. brings up brings up our energy. Now, do you do you routinize your day? Do you try to to do you try to keep to a schedule or keep certain activities that you do on an everyday basis uh, that that help to center and ground you, Matthew? I do it. <laughs> it's not it's something that I did for 25, 30 years, but I've gotten out of it perhaps as a rejection towards my past. But <laughs> but I have to reconcile because there's so much goodness in that. So I'm I would say uh, there's, there's certainly things I want to do better. And I'm on a journey right now of I'm improving every day. But yes, like morning routines are so important. I would say that it's important for all of us to have certain pillars around which we build our day. Right? That the certain, and they usually can fit on one hand, the, the activities or behaviors or routines that help me to show up best. And if we can keep those in place and then everything else sort of revolves around that, then we're definitely in a good position. So I, I that's what I try to do. Now I want to go local to global. As you've been on all these podcasts and all the, uh, what ha what are the themes that the, the podcast hosts are asking you about? What are, are there some, some general themes that you see that is going on in the, in the human in 2023? Uh, there is, it appears to me that we're on the cusp of an evolution that we're actually, that the human being in combination with AI is going into some kind of an, of an, evolutionary state maybe it's a uh whatever whatever the the humanity is going into it appears and so there's there's a lot of challenges in this are going on what kinds of questions are being asked by the podcast hosts from all the podcasts that you've been on can you can you generalize a theme no i can't be i've i've been on different podcasts that sort of take different approaches um and there's a few coming out that have been just fascinating conversations. But I can talk a little bit. Yeah, about that's better. Like Rather than themes, let me ask a better question in this thing. Tell me some of the themes that have resonated with you and some of the areas that you went, ah, that's that's a place that I want to want to dig into. Right. The And this goes with the other question, right, with the evolution of, of humanity, right? How and I love to talk about the human element. Now, that's why, right? But 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 that's our experience but in so many different settings and what the human being um, lives and goes through. And I've been given unique windows into humanity through through being in ministry for so many years. So I consider that a great gift. And I want, by being on podcasts, I look to bring two things. One is my personal experiences and things I've learned in my own life and my personal stories. Some, some of the podcasts are about that. And others is just my knowledge of the human person and the human experience and to enlighten that. So with that is the human element. It, 
I think society and with the workforce and everything, there's we're going from what the, what they might call the one side of the brain to the other, you know, from the side of the brain that has just a lot of knowledge and, and skills and, and because that was the way the world worked for many years and, and it worked. But now with AI and with computers and with machines, there's now the workforce is almost like it's, it's looking for people that are much more creative, innovative. Um, that's why there's a big focus on emotional intelligence. And in this regard, there's a huge focus on, on us developing a lot of our aspects of our humanity. Yes. That in some ways we're underdeveloped. Um, so I, that doesn't- I love through. that. But I love, I love what you said there because that's a particular issue of mine because I would, I would hear people say things like, oh, uh, hey, look, it's business, it's not personal. And I think, wait a minute, I'm a human being here. How is it not personal? How do we lose the human element? We can't, we're not just digits. We're not just uh, uh, binary states. We, we, are, we are evolving artistic human beings that must be taken into account. And that's what I love about bring, what's happening now is that people yes. are bringing into account the human element into each and every interaction. Indeed, that's exactly what's happening. But like with all novelty, there's a lot of resistance. It's difficult. The change is hard. <laughs> but you know, with, well, what institutions have to be or be start are starting to realize is um, we have to do a lot more than just produce products yes. right? or, or sell services. We there's a demand that we take care of our people, and it's 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 a it's a big shift in the workforce because it means. Having leaders who have that ability, yes. Um, having teams that have that ability, you know, and having an HR department that has that ability, and it and it means putting investing funds. Right, there's a lot of investment of energy, time, people, training, education, funds, and business leaders can be can have a hard time with that because obviously it takes away from from maybe some of the the profits that might be helpful in other ways. In the short term. But I don't believe that it takes away in the long term. In the no. long term, we will end up having much greater abundance when we make this investment in the first. And that's the thing about when we talk about business leaders. Business leaders understand you have to put money into infrastructure and you're not going to get your money back the very first uh, few years that you invest the money into infrastructure or you put into something into research and development. You're not doing that but we're putting research and development into the human capital, mm -hmm. the human capital that we can. And that's one of the things I love about you coming from ministry into business. Well, not that ministry isn't a business. I mean, it's business yeah. also, but still from, from your experience of where you come from, Matthew, you have the opportunity to be able to see these elements, these nurturing supportive elements that were in, that were in, your ministry as you're going you're seeing how they're applying this is my words you tell me if i'm correct you're seeing how these are desperately needed and apply within the business environments in deeply practical ways mm -hmm. yes but applying them in practical ways i think can be difficult for a lot of people in leadership roles because people in leadership roles are usually often end up in those roles because they're good at what they do in their sector oftentimes i'm generalizing um but they might not be they need to develop other aspects of skill sets for in order to lead and to be able to, to really look at their people in a deeper way rather than just in then the sector but with this i would say that um what are the benefits the benefits is our people will work better our people, you know, what we call positive organizational behavior, well-being, when our people are doing well, they're gonna they're gonna work better. the The environment will be better. People will be more productive, and then, like you said, in the long run, and even in the short run, as regards a year or two, there's a lot of things that will improve, and then turnover will be much less because it's so interesting nowadays. There's there's the loyalty to a business to a company which was a big deal decades ago, the new generation, they have no loyalty. They have loyalty to themselves. And if their organization helps them to grow and to be better, then they will continue to work there. If it doesn't, then they're going to go somewhere else. Right. 
Well, and and while they don't have the, the the same loyalty, but the loyalty that was in the past was just a blind loyalty. You were there. You were there. You you started uh, at, at this particular level. You stayed with the entire company, and then you retired with them. Well, when that when that agreement was broken. Now we have to find out what is a new loyalty. And the loyalty has to be is, do I truly care about and value you as a human being, as an individual, as a member? Do I value what your contributions are? Do I value what you bring to the table? Because if I do that, I'm going to have an employee for, I'm going to have an employee for life, even if, even if whatever work happens or however work happens it works in pieces like 60 percent of my time is devoted to this organization and 20 percent. i mean the world of work or how we're going to be able to parse this out it's going to be very different in the, in the uh in, in this next coming in these next coming decades than we're seeing it now don't you think i think so yes and i but i don't see it as overly complex uh, it's actually when we talk about it, it's actually quite simple and which is just showing up as better human beings, taking care of our people. People, our people want to be seen, yes. they want to be valued. Right. And I, I promise that most people will stay with a company where they see they sense that they are seen and valued and appreciated rather than go to a company where they won't get that, even if they get a higher salary. There's something about that that people really value, people want that. And and really, in the end, that's what we want as human beings, whether it be your spouse, whether it be your children, whether it be your friends. This is something that we yearn for as human beings. Now that's the, so it's simple, but a lot of people in the workforce like, well, that's not our job. Our job. <laughs> but it behooves, it will do serve you well as a leader to be able to do this because it will bring many benefits for you as a person, for your people, and for your company and business. Exactly. And do you do you have a, one of the things that has been in the news lately has been talking about how businesses uh, should not be woke, this idea of wokeness and the, the idea and it really bothers me because, first of all, uh, I'm working to, to understand the definition exactly why we're talking about it that way or why we shouldn't because I believe that a business needs uh, in order to succeed, it needs a bottom bottom line that has more than just red and black. It had there is a green. There's an investment in what am I doing as a, a corporate? What is a corporate citizen citizenry all about? Because it, you we exist here. We exist here on this land on the on as part of this ec ecosystem. And it's important for us to say, okay, well, what is my responsibility in order to be part of it, in order to keep it going? So there's a lot in corporate responsibility. So when you're when you're hearing these words about how uh, corporations shouldn't be uh, should stay away from anything that that has to do with woke and has and this this idea, what do you think about what 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 triggers off in your mind when you when you think about that, Matthew? Thank you. Then this is that's a complex topic. Now we we don't exist in a vacuum. We exist in society in a context, and we and I would say we have to pay attention to that because the more we pay attention to it, the more we'll be able to adapt in an appropriate way. That's the the, the way I would say it. Now the woke or the, the this sort of these ideologies or or this this big push for certain things. It's so important to, to see the value in certain things, but now that sometimes they're pushed to an extreme measure, right? And they're no. sort of like they're just pushed on us. And and I believe that there's always value in it, but always with good measure, right? Balance is so important. Exactly. Now the difficulty, I think the difficulty is that um this certain if you want to call it ideologies or expectations, it's being pushed on organizations and it's being made a priority. Or let's just say it's being overemphasized as it, it, so they're making it yes it's important but they're making it so much more important in so many ways than than it really is and that what does that do it creates rejection you you don't do your cause much favor by making it so either extreme or so pushy um now there's other things about the woke ideology or there's there's some premises that that I would be cautious with because some of them come from 
more of this the Marxist and social tendencies, right? Which which don't lead to don't lead to good things, and they're not. Right. They're well, not. Yeah. Well, they're that's not... why I have to live is because I am a capitalist. I believe that capitalism is the best economic system there. I want my capitalism to be conscious. I want to, there, to, there, to, there to be elements within that that say, I because I live in this capitalist society, because I have so many blessings, because I have so many opportunities, it, it is my obligation in order to give back to keep it going in other words there, there, there's a there's a song and i anybody who's listening to this please go it's a kinston trios it call it's called desert peat uh and i don't know have you ever heard that that song no i haven't well it's one that i want you to all right kingston trio just go desert peat and and listen to it because what they talk what he talks about in this is is a uh is our responsibility uh, to others that when we get, you know, those to those of us that a lot have been given, we need to make sure that we're able to pass it along so that the rest of the people can also can also benefit uh, as part of it. I mean, it's part of the responsibility of what I have here uh, in 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 being part of our uh, our environment. And and I know that that this has been uh, a, a big part of what you're doing. And uh, you're right now, you're in Massachusetts, right? That's right, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I want you to know, it's been a while since we've talked. And, I had, and one of the reasons why I'm so all over the place, I have so many, is because I haven't talked to you enough. Mm -hmm. So I would, love, I would love to have an opportunity to be able to have a more guided, as we're going along, continue to have a guided experience because Matthew, you have so much wisdom and you have so much of uh, uh, compassion and in your experience and so much practicality. That's the one thing that I, uh, that I so impressed with about you is that you combine wisdom with practicality so that you have both of those, both of those in your coaching practice and in, in what you're doing in order to help us to be able to move on to the move on and, and grow uh, and really to be able to succeed in this in this uh, in this time of opportunity. Thank you, Dennis. Well, yeah, we have to talk more often and we can record these sessions and get them out there or however, exactly. whatever best serves you. And that's right. And this is how it best serves us and it best serves the community. All right. Now, right now, how often do you use LinkedIn? What do you use it for? How do you how do you use it in order to promote your coaching practice, in order to promote your work? What's your what's what's the methodology and how is it being used or underused as far as you're concerned? Thank you, Dennis. Well, yeah, I wouldn't consider myself I'm not an expert by no means, but I use it. I would I can just explain how I use it. I've realized that when you, if you're familiar with LinkedIn, when you comment on someone other someone else's post, you do them a favor because it gives it more visibility. So I see that as a way to to support others because I've seen others that do that to me. And another thing that I do is I'm for me starting a practice. I just visibility is very important. So getting visibility and credibility. Now this isn't important for everyone. Right? Some people that have other types of jobs. That's not on their agenda, right? They use LinkedIn for other things. So I use it for networking, for connecting with people that I, I think that we, where we can collaborate or where I would learn something from them. Um, and it's, I love that LinkedIn is very it's professional, right? So it's, it's much more to the point and easy to understand um, than other social media and platforms for the for professional purposes. Um, and hopefully people will always keep it that way. So it's networking, looking for ways to sit for synergy, for collaboration, the way that I can, and so many people that I can learn from. So that's, I use it for that. And I use it generally, I'm, I'm constantly publishing things. And usually they're the same things, <laughs> but I do it because every time I know that they're going to reach someone, someone new because of the algorithms or because I've recently connected with new people. So it's, what does that do? It creates an image which is often that is, is not accurate, but it creates an image of, of credibility and of that I'm doing a lot when in actuality, I'm really not. And, and it's, I'm not trying to be, and it's not an attempt to be dishonest. No. It's just, I want to create an, it's about getting visibility, traction and credibility and creating content. And so that's, I use podcasts, getting on people's podcasts as a way to create content. And because I enjoy having the conversations, I, I think I have a lot to share. Um, 
but I can use other people's platforms. So it's a win-win where they benefit from it. And, and then I promote their podcast and they benefit from having me and I benefit from being able to be on their platform. The win-win concept. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for this time today. Thank you for giving me a, uh, so, a, a reconnection with you. I know that there are so many subjects that I'm going to want to talk with you about that we'll get into in later, uh, in later uh, opportunities, depending upon where we are in the world and how we're doing. But thank you, Matthew Brackett. Thank you for giving me this time today and, and for spending it with me. Thank you, Dennis, for this very spontaneous conversation. Let's do another one soon. We will. Thank you, everybody on LinkedIn, and we will see you all next time. This episode of Reasonably Spontaneous Conversations has been brought to you in part by In Search of the New Compassionate Male. For more information, go to newcompassionatemail.com.